like the same considerations also change how much they get paid. So an Uber driver, if you go out on a Friday night and it's rainy, odds are you're going to make more money because more people are making cabs. But say there's a drought and you're counting on that extra rain money, you have no guarantee. It's much more out of your control. It's much less stable. And one thing about human beings is we just like stability. And the less stability we have, the worse our mental health is. Yeah, I was going to add it too. Like, I think that's, that, that's true. Like, the, the, the stability of it, because you need three jobs, because you know, you, know, the, you know the stability of one job is not steady. But I think also it, it's a combination of the three. Like, because you need all these jobs to maintain a, whatever aspiration you have for income. Like, like, if you could find an income where you could make all that money in that, you wouldn't need three unstable, uh, unstable jobs. You yeah, and exactly. So, like, the fact is you need three unstable jobs because, well, one job isn't really cutting it anymore outside of certain fields. So, why is it that one job isn't really cutting it? Well, changes in technology have fundamentally changed what sorts of careers are viable. So, manufacturing jobs have gone down in America for basically two major reasons, both of which are technology related. Technology gonna do most of it. One is, what are the two major region, reasons? One of them is the manufacturing itself is much more automated. Robots do a lot now. And the fact is, you do not, a robot is much cheaper than a human worker. Why? They can constantly work. They can constantly work, they never complain, and they don't eat anything. They don't need a bathroom break. They are very consistent. Unless they physically break, it's a lot easier. And so you can have one per. They also, you don't have to pay a robot. You just pay for the electricity to make it run. Robots aren't going to get mad that you aren't paying them enough. Like, that's just the nature of robots. So that's part of it, is so many jobs. Like, um, the fact is that uh, if you actually look since, I, I think these numbers are right, or the, this general point, there have been a lot of companies returning to America in terms of building new manufacturing systems since Trump came to office. But the difference is there's been almost no increase in jobs because most of the new factories are mostly robots. So that's one way. And the other issue is there are places in the world that don't use robots. How, and these places are where much manufacturing gets done, but it doesn't get done here. Why? Because it's shipping and transport and everything with the modern technology is so much easier that is much more economically viable to set up your factories in China or Vietnam or somewhere else that isn't in the United States. So both factory jobs are now um, the sort of thing where uh, you now have way less stability and like working in a factory, odds are you will probably get laid off because your job will either be moved overseas or will be taken over by a robot. And because of this, people are forced to find free, quick paying, easy jobs where you don't need that much. Like to become a quality member of a factory, you need some training, you need some experience. But you know, in the gig economy, it's basically you're up for yourself. And the other thing is because there are so many people who know how to drive an Uber, if you don't do a good job, they can just kick you out and then you know, you're done and somebody else will take your place. And so that's one major difference with this is so who doesn't have these worries, though? So this is a huge part of the population these days, but not everyone has these worries. Who doesn't have to worry about this? Who isn't worried about these sorts of things? So doctors, lawyers, um, computer science people, these are the sorts of careers where because of the nature of the career itself, you can avoid this sort of gig economy. You don't have to worry about going into this. But here's the, the issue and why this is still an issue of like opportunity. What's the number one way to become a doctor or a lawyer or a computer scientist? You gotta go to college. You gotta go in debt. And you have to go either in debt or if you wanna go to school and you don't want student loans, what is your, what's your best way of doing it? You gotta get a, you gotta get a job. So that's one way, but an even better, simpler way that you have no control over is what? How rich your parents were. The quickest, easiest way to make sure that you do not go into student loan debt is to have been born to loaded parents. Because if your parents are rich and will put you through college, you don't have to worry about paying for it. 
And so how does this fundamentally change the opportunities? Well, it means that the people who are going to become doctors, because to go to medical school, you have to take out a lot of loans. And if you want to get into the top medical school, you have to do well in college. And you know what's a much better way of doing well in college? Cheating. Well, cheating is one way. But um, more commonly, it's to be able to put a lot of time and effort into your schoolwork. And who's going to be able to put more time and effort into their schoolwork? The student who goes to school and their parent pays for tuition and they don't have to have a job, or the student who's going to a school and has to have three jobs just to pay for tuition? Well, the one who's already started with a ton of money is the one who's more likely to avoid going into the gig economy, who's more likely to succeed in school, who's more likely to end up with a job that isn't going to maybe get lost. So you've got this thing where whose parents are more likely to be rich? Well, the people who say, if your parents are doctors, that you probably had enough money not to have to have student debt, which means you are more likely to get the education, which is more likely to make you a doctor, which is more likely to make you less likely to give your kids student debt. And this is what we see with the way technology has changed this. This middle class jobs where you can be pretty certain that you're going to have a stable career just aren't existing in the same number of ways. Another one is things like retail. If you decided to work in retail like 30 years ago, you might start on the shop floor and then you might get better and you might be promoted to assistant manager and then you might be promoted to manager and then maybe you even get like promoted up to regional manager. You could turn working in retail into a lifetime career. Does that exist anymore? Some places, but the numbers have gone down thanks to what? Automation, robots, robots and AI. Online e-commerce. There we go. We have like above every. You need to buy something. Your your phone charger breaks, and you need one by the end of the week. How are you getting this phone charger? Like literally, personally, I had this problem this week, and I bought a new phone charger. I actually got a three pack. Where did I get it? Amazon. Where would you have gotten it? Amazon. Why? It's fast. It's cheap. It shows up to my house. I am going to Amazon because for me, the consumer, it is simpler and easier. But what's the downside? All of those jobs in commerce, those stable middle class sort of I can work in retail for my whole life, those jobs are disappearing. The only, there's a very small percentage of jobs that you don't have to worry about losing. And they're jobs like being doctors, being lawyers, being like, if you get very good at computer science. But the thing is, because computer tech is changing so much, you have to make sure to stay up on it. Or another good one is uh, you just get lucky and happen to get, become a member of a particular computer uh, company right before it explodes or you have a really great idea and you put it forward and you happen to be one of the ones who starts the Google or starts the or Apple. Free market. Like, and so this is the, so on the one side, so here's the other side with back to the positives. If you are the person who starts Microsoft or Google, you have people who are college students who come up with a cool idea who end up set for life because they came up with a cool idea and use the internet to get it out there. But on the other side, you have huge numbers of people who do not have that sort of stability. And the fact is, there's a percentage of people who, like, the number of Bill Gates is out there. Like, there's a reason we know Bill Gates by name. It's because there aren't many. There's a reason we know, like, these big time tech major idea people by name. And it's only a handful of them. Because the vast majority of people are finding less opportunities in certain types of like stable middle class jobs thanks to the changes in tech and the way it's affected the economy. Uh, I mean, isn't college degree always required for a um, good job, even if it was like in 1960, 1950s? No, no, not really. So back, if you actually look in the 1950s, um, so my parents were both the first people in their families to go to college. And both of their parents had steady jobs where they never really had to worry about paying the bills. Both of them had multiple children. Like both sets of my like my grandparents, 
They had multiple children. My mom's dad worked in a puzzle making factory in Wisconsin and worked there his whole life. He like literally was cutting jigsaw puzzles and they were able to go on nice family vacations. He wasn't college educated. And then my, my dad's dad worked uh, as a, he worked in the subway. Back when the subway still functioned, he was like a station manager. And he wasn't college educated either. And back then, it was like to go to college was like a very select path, but it was not mandatory in the same sort of way it is now. And because of this, you had a lot fewer people going on with huge amounts of student debt. So in a certain sense, it's always been necessary if you wanted to become a doctor or a lawyer or make it to the top levels. But you could get by, like if you decided college isn't for me, I want to spend my life just like, I'm okay with a job that like is not the most fascinating thing to me, but I never have to worry about paying the bills and I can raise a family and pay off a house and live happily. You did not need a college education for it until more recently. And one more thing is like um, people kind of complain about like how computer like taking jobs away, but at the same time it also created a lot of jobs. Yeah, so here's the thing. And what we're another thing to keep in mind is there's a difference here between lessening opportunities and changing opportunities. So one thing to keep in mind with computer technology is there's now a huge number of jobs that did not exist before. Things like every sort of software engineering, any sort of app design. These are things which didn't exist. And so the opportunities, though, are different, and the skills that are required are different. And what we're finding is it's not just that people are like, it's more the people who had the skills from the pre this economy. Who, so like you can still find stable jobs in computer science and that sort of thing, but you have to have a different set of skills and it requires like going back or being born at a time where you can now get a computer science degree and be ready for this. So there is a sense where like there are elements in which the gig economy is taking over and it's areas where it used to be stable, but there are now new stable areas that didn't exist before and that's a really good point to bring up. Um, and things like, you know, IT departments. If you, if you know how to do cybersecurity, like, there is a job for you out there. Like, here's the thing, like, if any of you, if your number one concern is making sure that you get a job after college, go into cybersecurity. They are, there are never enough people in cybersecurity for how many big companies need a cybersecurity division. You're almost guaranteed to get a job. Now, I'm not sure exactly whether it's a, like what the hours would be, and I'm sure the pay would be pretty solid. Like, I'm, I don't think you're going to become a multi-billionaire, but you're also not going to be like having to work at Panera Bread on like Saturdays on the side. <laughs> like, you could probably just have one job, and it'll be pretty consistent. I have nothing against Panera Bread, by the way. I like their bread. Um, I think they're a perfectly good place to work. But yeah, so that's what we're talking about here. Is that um, like this is a, a major change. And there are new stable ones, but there are a lot of other ones that don't exist. And so it's just navigating it. And things which used to be stable aren't there anymore. And skills that used to make you safe aren't there anymore. And that's another just change is because technology is getting ever faster and repeating ever more, there is this sense in which you have to constantly be keeping up with it in a way that you didn't before. So to, if you want to keep yourself competitive in like if you go into cybersecurity you are going to have to keep learning every single day and stay on top of it um, so yeah that's another issue okay so here what's another one though what are some other things so we've been talking about um, tech provides you with access to other things but here's another issue in which opportunity like inequality of opportunities increase with tech is we've just talked about how much power tech gives you so what happens if you so most people in the world now have access to technology, but think about the handful who don't. Like there are people who don't have access to technology or who doesn't have access to technology either physically or functionally. Like they could use it, it's there, but they can't really use it. So children is one, if you're too small, but we take care of them generally. Some, some of like, uh, yeah, older people are majorly at a disadvantage these days. If, if you are at an age where you have trouble using the internet, you are so far behind everybody else in terms. I used to be smarter than a fifth grader, but. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like seriously, if you wanted to have a website designed for you, think of like one of your smartest professors who's like over the age of 60, say. Imagine this person right now, 
They could be the smartest person you know, or imagine like a sixth grader. Who would you want designing your website? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you want that sixth grader. It doesn't matter how smart that other person is, because the sixth grader is going to figure it out and know like the basics of the computer. The 60 plus year old professor, there's a decent chance they aren't going to. Maybe they do, but not everyone does. And that's another thing. Or like, just think about all the ways in which, yeah, like people are just lack of access. Another thing is just think about differences in access to tech. Like another difference is the more money you have, the better your access to technology generally. Why? What are some examples? If you have as much, say, say you make a million dollars a year, or even better, ten million dollars a year. Describe the difference between you and somebody who makes thirty thousand dollars a year when it comes to access to technology. If you make ten million dollars a year, what's your computer look like? First off, it's not going to be your computer. It's going to be your computers. You're going to have as many as you need, and they're all going to be top of the line. What's your internet connection going to be like? Super fast. Super fast. Super fast with VPN. Yeah, you're gonna have VPN so you can access anywhere you want so that nobody's tracking you. Um, what else? Describe some other things. How much time are you gonna have to spend uh, dealing with your faulty um, thermostat? Very little. Very little. Why? You just pay someone, they show up, and they fix it. You've got the newest technology. You got everything. No, you don't have the newest technology. You have the technology that came out that doesn't. Even come yeah, you out have the phone. you have the iPhone 17 already. Yeah, exactly. Like oh, you are so far ahead. Now compare this to somebody who makes thirty thousand dollars a year. What are the differences? If you're somebody who makes, or even say twenty thousand dollars a year. You can wait for the iPhone 10. Yeah, there's a good chance that you don't have the best phone. Or imagine that your phone, God forbid, breaks. You aren't going to be able to afford a new one. Yeah, or exactly. you compare this to somebody else. If they're like, if Kylie Jenner's seventh phone breaks, she's got six others. Um, if your phone breaks and you can barely pay the bills, you are so far at a disadvantage. And not just in terms of like, think about all the ways you need your phone for work or for school. Imagine if you're like, just imagine today your computer breaks for school and you cannot afford a new one. What does it look like? What do you have to do? You're coming to school and you're having to write in the library on one of those computers. And like, if you are also working a job, there's a chance you aren't going to be able to do that. These are the ways in which, you know, access to tech is very much tied to uh, equality at the beginning. So the richer you are, the better your access to tech. And because tech is so crucial, the more access to tech you have, the more opportunities you have. So it's not just, it's the sort of thing where income inequality has always led to differences in equality of opportunity. But because the nature of tech makes everything bigger, if you had won the money before, then it maybe say multiplied it by two and then you had two times the opportunity. But what you can think of tech doing is just adding a multiplier in here. If you can access the, think about how much better you can do school than somebody who has no access to the internet. It's so much different that now, if you don't meet this money threshold, you're now not at a 10 percent or a two percent or a two times deficit. You're at a 20 times deficit. So does everyone understand what I'm saying? It's just technology, because of the nature of tech and how much power it gives you, the difference between somebody with very good access to it and somebody with no access to it is so much larger. Like the difference between being very wealthy and being not so wealthy is a bigger difference once you throw tech in. It just makes it so much bigger and faster and stronger to have access to that stuff. It used to be like if the if the rich still had to go to the library to get a book, then being the difference between being rich and poor wasn't as big as if the difference now is the rich person pulls out their iPhone, which isn't going to break, or if it does, they replace it compared to the person who's still going to the library. Or think about like if you have access to a printer or, you know, if you have access to just, you know, the difference between how do you apply for jobs today? That's one. Think about how much harder it is to apply if you don't have internet access. What's the difference? What does it look like to apply to a job if you have 
if you don't have internet access compared to if you do. Price so earned in a poor man. Yes. First off, where are you going to find these jobs? Describe to me if you. I gave you the task right now. <laughs> I want you to come back with a job application next Friday, and I want you to have found this job without using the internet and write up your resume, resume, resume without using a computer, and write up your cover letter without using a computer. Oh. I, how would you even go about doing this? And then I want you to deliver your job application. How would you even know how to start? And that's another way. Like The people who have tech, it's, just, it's so assumed that you have access to it that if you don't, you're screwed in a way that you may not have been before. It will be nearly impossible. Yeah. These days, because there's such an assumption that everyone has it, trying to get anywhere or do anything without it is so hard. Or just like, think about how much free time you would lose if you didn't have access to Google Maps. Like on your phone. Imagine that your phone died and you're still rocking a dumb phone. Or even better, you have no cell phone at all. And just think about how much time during your week you would now have to spend looking up how to get places. But even more than that, like Google Maps, like if you don't have Wi Fi, you can't even use Google Maps. Yeah, so here's another one. It's just like there's another difference here. Like, let's go with something more reasonable. Somebody who can afford an internet connection on their phone versus somebody who can't. And that's a much more reasonable one of like people who literally just cannot afford having the best 4G network or 5G network on their phone. If you have access to that, like you've got two businesses, you've got a somebody who has internet connection on their phone versus somebody who doesn't, and say it's like the plumber, you want to be able to email him with the problem. Or like say you're working with a company who's like designing something for your house, you want to be able to email them. And if they don't have internet connection on the phone, it makes a major difference for their business. So, or like, you know, Wi-Fi is not cheap. It is not, and there are plenty of people who do not have Wi-Fi. And imagine, like, just think about how screwed this school would be if our Wi-Fi went out. Like, how important it is to so much of education to have access to this technology. And if you don't have it, like, ask the tech is a major determiner in equality of opportunity. And so the less money you have, the mess less access to tech. And so what we see here is what tech is really doing is on the one hand, opening doors that have never been opened before, and on the other hand, leading to problems that have never been there before in terms of amount and time and things like that. And then here's another one, is if we're saying that, um, so let's just finish this off with, uh, what are the biggest companies in the world right now? Google, Microsoft, IBM. IBM is still up there. Apple. What do all of these companies have in common? Monopoly. They're tech companies. Monopoly. They're monopolistic tech companies. So but they why? Ban monopolies and so, but the thing is, because of the nature of their power and the amount of it, so basically, because the nature of tech is such that it is everywhere. Whoever owns the tech companies, and specifically those tech companies that got big first, are now, in terms of wealth and power and inequality, on a different scale than things we've seen since like the Middle Ages. Because the fact is, if you, like Google's economy is now bigger than many countries. Like if, if like Google could hire an army and invade somewhere, if they so chose. They have no reason to, but they could do it. Like, what, like, Apple last, what was it, last summer hit a trillion dollars in valuation? That is a huge amount of money for a company to have. That is, that is a nation size. And so what we're also seeing in terms of differences is because tech is so big and can make so much money, people in tech are now reaching levels of wealth that are so much above and beyond the average human being that it's not just that this access to tech and this access to other things. It's now because the people who have the tech and have the tech companies are getting so wealthy because we now need, everyone needs tech to get by, that like if I told you to stop using Google, nobody would be able to live their lives. But because of this, Google is now reaching levels of wealth that are so high that the opportunities of the people at Google and the families of the people high up at Google is so much more that we now are at the level of income inequality that is so much different than anything that's coming before. So just like, what are we doing on time? 
We're going to finish up here in the final 10 minutes. But here's just like, so we all know, how much money is a billion dollars? It's a lot of money. A billion dollars is a lot of money, and there are billionaires out there. We know some of them by name. They are very wealthy. But let's talk about the difference between being like rich and being billionaire wealthy. And so this is something where if you do the math, like it's not that crazy. You just think like, oh yeah, that's like, that's how numbers work. But when you hear it laid out, if you made a hundred, how many of you raise your hand if you'd be happy if you made $100,000 a year for the rest of your life? <laughs> okay, you want more. So there are some people who want more, but $100,000, like if you were told, like guarantee, like right now, I come up to you and I say, here's your deal. You're going to have a job, you work nine to five for the rest of your life, I'll give you $100,000 a year for it, would you take the deal? Yes. But then, yes. years from now, $100,000 may not So, so let's say $100,000 current <laughs> buying power. Right let's say buying power of $100,000 <laughs> right now. So like, I including inflation. Like, the, let's imagine like it'll go up. So the equivalent of today's $100,000 for the rest of your life. I would probably take it.